All right. So greetings, everyone. This is Wojciech Kaczmarski from the M17 project. And today we are going to play with FPGAs a little bit. But before I start, uh, let's check if the audio level is OK. Uh, testing, testing. Right, should be OK. All right, so I've got the feedback that the audio is OK. Uh, but the image is distorted. Uh, I have no idea what's going on. Maybe it's my not so good Wi-Fi connection today. But can you read the text from my screen? Oh, yeah, that's because my screen is uh, 5 to 4 ratio. <laughs> it's not 16 to 9. I'm old school, and my screen is 5 to 4. But anyway, uh, it should be fine. Right, so let's get going. Uh, let's start with uh, let's start with the basics. Uh, let, let me tell you what the setup is today. So I've got an FPGA board uh, that's a lattice LIFCL40. And I've got an STM32 board, STM32F767 disco board. It's a nuclear board from ST. And that's all connected to uh, an Atmel board with RF. Uh, sorry, AT86RF215. That's an IQ transceiver. And that's all connected, connected together <clears throat> to a signal anal analyzer that we've got right here. And uh, I also have a signal generator, a two channel one. The first channel is the 18 megahertz clock for the FPGA, and the other channel is used for the modulation in. So uh, the modulation output from that generator is just connect connected to the ADC of the STM32. And the STM32 the STM is used to sample the baseband and pass the data over SPI to the FPGA. All right, so that is the spectrum of the signal. And right now, the configuration looks like this. Uh, the FPGA runs on the NCO that sees just uh, nothing at the output. So the, the ATC input is just floating. And if I apply a sine wave to it, uh, one kilohertz sine wave, we see something like this, which is expected. Then if I turn the signal off, uh, the carrier moves down because uh, the ADC, of course, is supplied by 3.3 volts. So you have to supply, you have to present half of that uh, to get the carrier in the center. So I can actually try and output a DC voltage of 1.65 volts. And that should bring the carrier uh, to the middle and let me check how to do it. Uh, my signal source is Sigland SDG2042X. Now, how do I do that? Uh, let me try by waveform DC, DC offset. All right, so it's zero right now. Let me try and set it to 1.65. All right, and now that's it. All right, so the STM32 samples the, the voltage of the ADC. Now, the voltage is 1.65, so that's half of the 3.3. And after sampling that, uh, it's converted into a signed int 
and sent to the FPGA over SPI. So in the FM mode, uh, by applying half of the supply voltage, we are getting a continuous wave at the carrier frequency. So that's expected. Now, if we change the voltage a little bit, I'm going down now it's one volt. And if we go up, that's 2.45, we go up. And the spurs on the spectrum are caused by the mm, by the fixed point arithmetic that's going on inside the FPGA, I believe. But that's nothing to worry about right now. Let's go back to 1.65. All right, so that's the carry wave. Uh, now let's try and do this. Uh, our aim is to, uh, for today, of course, not in general, uh, our aim is to transmit PSK using the, set, the setup that I have. And probably next time I'm going to use my camera because it's a good idea to see what's going on. Yeah, uh, so the idea is to uh, use the existing block for the FPGA that I've got right here. Uh, that's frequency mod. Yeah, so this is the part that does the frequency modulation. That's the numerical, numerically controlled oscillator. It's hard to pronounce, but the principle of operation is pretty easy, pretty simple. Uh, so in our case, we've got uh, <clears throat> a sine and cosine lookup tables right here. And the file for that is probably... Syncos. Yeah, that's it. So it's, uh, it's just one lookup table with 257 entries. That's 256 plus one, obviously. <clears throat> and all samples are uh, stored as uh, signed integers, 16 bits. So this is just a quarter of the sine wave. And of course, if we want to obtain cosine wave, we have to do some simple arithmetic uh, because sine wave starts at zero and the cosine starts at one. So we have to do some adding and subtraction to get the actual volume, <clears throat> the actual volume for the uh, for the output. So normally, uh, if you want to use this block, you just pass the theta, so the Theta or theta? I'm not sure how to pronounce that word, actually. Uh, so that's the uh, the phase information. And then after passing the phase, you get sine and cosine outputs. So if you pass zero, you get zero at the sine output and one at the cosine output. And if I remember correctly, in our case, the unity is equal to, if I remember correctly, in our case, Unity is equal to this value. So this is just one bit before uh, one bit before uh, the sign in. It's it's like the maximum value, the maximum positive value that the sign int can hold. All right, so that's it. So we are going to use this block for the PSK. Now, how to do it? Let's take a look at the netlist analyzer. Let's see what's... Oh, no. Let's see inside the FPGA right now, uh, looking from this block. So this is the control register block. So all the control, control registers right there and right now i've got the control register map opened up so that's it 
it's not very complicated. We've got just a few registers for general control for the FPGA. So we can set the band, the modulation type, uh, the phase distortion for the FM, uh, the source of the, let me check what. <laughs> Oh, that's the uh, that's not relevant right now because that's for later use. Because normally, when you pass the baseband from the STM32 to the FPGA, you have to know when to sample the signal. So this is just a, an option for the future, so that the FPGA can tell when the STM32 is supposed to uh, send another baseband sample. So the FPGA would then dictate the sample rate of the transmitter. So that's that's for later. We can also set the uh, the sideband. We can select the sideband if we use the single sideband mode. But this is not our case right now. So we are going to try and set the mode. Set the mode to free, which is invalid for now or reserved, reserved for, for later. We're going to set it to three. And then there is one register that is reserved just like that. So you've got the frequency tuning word, amplitude modulator, and SSB modulator, all in bits. And then there is one register that is reserved for experiments, and we are going to use it. The address of that is C. Uh, the address are 15 bits. The most significant bit is telling if there is a read or write operation going. So let's do this. Uh, let's take a look at the netlist analyzer. So those are the control registers and uh, we set those over SPI. That's the SPI stuff. It's uh, master route and slave in. So the other side is the output, which is the master in slave out. So after receiving receiving the uh, the command to read or write to a register. We are going to store a value for the baseband in the register C, I believe. Yeah, in register C, in hexadecimal. So that's uh, A, B, C, register. So <clears throat> it's connected to a QAM modulator. So we are going to uh, break this connection. And our new block PSK mode. But before we do that, uh, let's actually see what's going on with the signal uh, from the IQ samples to the AT86 transceiver chip. So the samples are uh, sourced with, no, that's the decimation block. I haven't looked at this for like a week, <laughs> so I have to refresh my memory. All right. All right. So this is the demodulator. Yeah, those blocks right here. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse pointer, but uh, those blocks, those blocks in the center, uh, starting with this one. That's the amplitude modulator. Let's take a look how it looks like inside. Let's take a peek inside. Show schematic. Yeah, it's very simple actually. Uh, <clears throat> when we do amplitude amplitude modulation, we actually change the in-phase value. The quadrature just stays at zero because we don't care about it. So, uh, for example, if we wanted to transmit continuous wave, we would just set, set the in-phase signal to the maximum value, which is one and then expect the transmitter to, to just output a sine wave. 
continuous wave, CW. And then if you wanted to modulate it uh, with respect to the amplitude, we could just set the I word, the in-phase uh, component to something, anything between zero and one. So for half of the amplitude, we would set it to one half. And if we wanted to uh, totally attenuate the signal, we would just set zero. So this is the very simple blog for amplitude modulation. No magic here, no rocket science. Now let's go one step back and, and take a look at the frequency modulator, which is a little bit more sophisticated. So the frequency modulator actually uses uh, sine and cosine lookup tables, which are part of the NCO mentioned before. That's the sine and cosine lookup table. So normally, if we want to uh, transmit a carrier wave with frequency modulation, but the frequency tuning word would be zero then, in the case of uh, no modulation, uh, we would expect the signal to just um, stay at the carrier frequency, don't move. So uh, if the tuning word is zero, uh, we present that tuning word to a frequency, uh, the phase accumulator, sorry. And the phase accumulator just adds that value over and over, and over again. And in, in case of zero, the phase doesn't increase or decrease. So it just stays at zero. And therefore we get the continuous wave at the output. So nothing fancy happening. But if we want to transmit at slightly higher frequency, we have to change the tuning word to some positive value. The tuning word actually uh, is this signal. So there are some, uh, that's the, uh, the other block, but actually this one is the one that does the magic. So uh, you present it with the tuning word. If it's zero, then we get the carrier. If it's a positive value, then we get uh, an increasing value for the phase uh, accumulator. And the output is probably here. Yeah. So this is the current value, the red, the red signal. And now the red signal is the input. So uh, the value stored here just increases over time and flips back to negative values uh, if we hit the maximum value. So the phase accumulator we use is probably, yeah, it's 21 bits long. And the lookup table is, as you probably <laughs> already forgot, is 10 bits. Uh, we've got 257 samples, but that's just a quarter of the wave. Therefore, we've got 124 entries, and that's 10 bits. All right, so this is the frequency modulator block. We've got the modulator in, the phase accumu accumulator, the NCO as the lookup table, table. And then we've got, uh, this is just a latch for the output, I and Q. So this ensures that uh, the output of this block gets uh, uh, both of those values are in sync with, with each other. So it's synced with the master clock that is provided right here. That's the global clock. In our case, I believe it's 18 megahertz. I might be wrong, but let me check. Yeah, it is. That's 18 megahertz block a clock and just to be sure uh, because net names can be actually uh, you can have clock input CLK underscore I right here but in the global uh, net list you can have it too so let's check if, if that's the case <clears throat> so our block was here Frequency mod is CLK underscore I and it's clocked by. That's a 38 megahertz clock uh, from a PLL oscillator. 
So it's not 18 megahertz, it's 38, slightly higher. All right, anyway, uh, so that's the frequency modulator block. Then we also have the QAM block, which is simple. It's just uh, uh, the multiplexer, actually two of them. So we've got one each for I and Q. And uh, it looks very convoluted, like, what the hell? What is that? <laughs> Uh, the answer for that is hidden in the code for that block. So this is not readable at all. It's, it's like, what the hell? All right, so let's take a look at the code for it. Uh, it's um, QAM. It's not sorted in any way. That's it. Yeah, so this is the block. And uh, since it's a QAM modulation, and in fact, it's 16 QAM, so we've got 16 points in the constellation, the input to that block is three bits, which is four bits, sorry. Of course, it's four bits. It's 16 QAM. Uh, we've got four bits of data and then two outputs, both 16 bits signed in. I know it's standard logic vector, but later on it's uh, it's casted on a signed int. So we've got, if it's 16 QAM, we've got four by four constellation, and each of those values uh, tell the exact level for, for the, for each point, I mean each, each row or each column, because it's uh, rotationally symmetrical, I would say. I believe that's the cor correct term for that. So we've got uh, four levels. That's negative, mm, probably square root of two over two, but I'm not sure. Uh, we can probably check what's the intended value for that. Uh, D2BF. If we divide that by probably this value, okay, we get something, but it's not immediately obvious what that is. Hmm. And if we try this, it doesn't make sense to me. Okay, I don't remember. <laughs> Anyway, uh, those values should be minus three, minus one, plus one, and plus three. Of course, scaled by uh, some arbitrary factor because uh, the I and Q streams both uh, expect the values to be confined within a range of from minus one to plus one. So minus one is the maximum value that the absolute value of the of the value. Uh, shouldn't exceed one, I can tell you that. So uh, if in our in our case, if that's, uh, if the unity if is zero X for zero, 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 or seven and uh, all Fs, this value, uh, I believe this, oh, <laughs> I see the problem. That's the negative value, so I cannot just, divide that by something and expect it to be a same value. So let's try and divide this by, uh, let's try this value. Okay, doesn't ring a bell. Let's try and do something else. Let's divide the square root of two by this. Yeah, looks better. So probably this value or this value. Yeah, that's one third of a square root of two. So if I took this value, we should get Exactly, no, half, 
of the square root. Oh. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, I give up. I've got the answer to that in my MATLAB script, <laughs> which I wrote two weeks ago, and I don't remember how it worked. But anyway, those are four levels, four levels for the uh, 16 QAM. So without going into details, <laughs> uh, let's take a look at the map. So the block is just uh, a simple map that maps uh, four bits into four levels for two outputs. So, uh, so that's it. It's gray encoded. So if we got just one bit difference between two words, so the Hamming distance is one, we've got just, uh, so those points in the constellation are just neighbors. That's gray encoding. So one bit difference and those points are just neighbors. And it works for probably each pair, I suspect. And this, of course, shouldn't happen because uh, all of the valid values for the input are foreseen by this switch, the case. All right, so this is the QAM. And then we also have, let's go one level up. Then we also have the Hilbert transformer and the delay block for the single sideband. And Hilbert block is used to obtain uh, an analytical signal for a given input. And normally, uh, the Hilbert block is a, is a bandpass filter that rejects uh, low frequency component and high frequency component. Well, it's a bandpass filter, right? And the delay block is set to delay the signal uh, the right amount of time so that the output from the Hilbert block and the delay block are aligned in, uh, in phase. So actually, uh, you've got the input right here, which is uh, which goes from here. That's the decimation block. Before that block, uh, we've got the signal input. So we split it into two parts. The in-phase part gets uh, Hilbert transformed and uh, the other branch just gets delayed and both branches then go to the uh, demultiplexer. This demultiplexer block is used to select the modulation uh, within the FPGA. So you can set the register to the right value that is not here, but it's right here, the modulation selector. So you've got uh, three bits, 14, 13, and 12. Yeah, three bits to select the modulation. So by selecting uh, zero, which is the default value, you get the frequency modulator uh, through this block. So this, no, sorry, this is then connected to this output. And of course, we've got two branches because that's the in-phase and quadrature. Uh, output. Okay, so let's get back to the FM modulator block because that's going to be our uh, our source for the code for the phase mode. So let's do this. Uh, let's copy the code. Let's think about where to put it. Uh, we already know that we want to use the register 12 or C in hexadecimal. So we are going to use this register as the input. Then we are going to uh, present this signal to our PSK block. And that signal is going to tell, all uh, right, this signal is obviously 16 bits, but the lookup table is 10 bits. So we are going to do this. We are going to take 10 most significant bits of that register and present it to the lookup table. And then we can take the I and Q outputs from that block. So let's 
sorry, I've got the private message. Sorry. Uh, so then we can output the I and Q signals uh, to the demultiplexer or multiplexer, sorry. Uh, and then take it to the uh, DDR because the FPGA uh, is connected to the 8086 over uh, dual data rate uh, interface using LVDS. So that's pretty fast. All right. So uh, those three blocks that you see here is the digital predistortion that we use for the SSB mode and any that any modulation that is not a constant envelope. Then we've got uh, IQ balance that is used for um, for reducing the uh, the mirror frequency. So we can take a look at this later on. Then we've got the IQ offset, which is used to reduce the carrier leakage. Oh, and the digital predistortion is using a simple polynomial that is described in this document. And is available on GitHub. And the repository is probably uh, openht-fpga. And there is a directory called doc, and it's right there. It's in PDF format and doc format or ODT, rather. Anyway, uh, that's the polynomial for the digital predistortion. And I believe we are not going to cover this right now because it's out of the scope and the PSK is actually a constant envelope, so we don't need it. So we can talk about it later. Uh, all right, so we've got the code copied and now uh, let's do this. Let's start with creating a new file, VHDL. Let's call it uh, I know it's a play on ASM because the modulator is inside this M. But anyway, uh, we are nerds. We are not grammar Nazis, so let's have it. And uh, the name is similar to this one, so it, it looks good. All right, so let's start by <laughs> by uh, changing the the name of the month. Okay, so this is going to be a phase modulator. April. All right. Uh, let's change all that is immediately obvious. And for the frequency modulator, we actually had to. Uh, for the phase accumulator, we had to uh, add the control word, the tuning word, to the phase accumulator over and over again. And we had to feed a clock to that block to know where, when to do it, at which rate to do it. So for the phase modulation, we don't have to do it anymore. So we just get rid of that. Uh, so the Phase modulator doesn't need a reset signal, I believe. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we don't need a clock. We need the modulator in, which is 16 bits. Uh, we don't need no ether. And I and Q out. And that's probably it. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and just remove stuff that is not needed. And then phase modulator. PM modulator, okay. Uh, the syncos is needed, the dither other is not needed. That's for the FM only. Row I, row Q, that's probably not needed. Um, the phase is probably also not needed. But I'm going to comment it out for now. Uh, Synco slot is, of course, needed. Uh, we're going to do this. The face input is going to be the mod I. Uh, that's the theta. 
but let's look at the singles block actually if uh, we don't need this. The input is standard logic vector, 10 bits. All right, so obviously uh, mod i is 16 bits. So we need to do this. Now, uh, 10 bits would mean suspect. Uh, let's take a look again. Uh, 10 bits for the theta. Yep. Uh, oops. I know it's lame, but it sometimes helps. Uh, <laughs> okay, so that's 10 bits. Uh, sine O and cosine O are rooted to row Q and row I. This is not needed. And the process is not needed because we don't have any clocks right here. So basically, that's just uh, a single slot that takes the modulator in so for the for the phase modulator we actually could just use the syncos block but uh, that would make the the netlist a little bit hard to read and hard to understand so let's have the phase modulator block even if it's just a syncos table discussed discussed sorry <laughs> not, not discussed all right, so this is not needed. Uh, let's try and save this file. And by saving the file, uh, the Radiant actually checks the, the syntax for us. And row queue is not declared. Of course, it's not declared because I have just removed it. Uh, so let's do this. Let's root this signal like that. I believe that would work. Yeah, no errors, and the file is saved. So we are we are done here. Now, let's get back to the netlist analyzer. Let's take a look at the, um, at the register 12. That's it. Yeah. So it's rooted to, it's connect, connected to the QA and mode. Let's take a look where it is in the code. So this is the main, the, the top level file, which tells what's connected with with what and all that stuff. So we've got frequency D mod, control breaks. Mm -hmm -hmm. It should be somewhere here. Yeah, modulation selector, so QAM, yeah. So probably we can use those. Let's try and do this. Let's comment it out. Uh, so QAM mode. Yeah, so that just Rex RW12. Is that correct? Mod symbol, yeah. That's probably the name of the of the wire that connects uh, the registers and the QAM mode. So that's the signal. It's four bits. That's not good. Not not enough for us. But of course, we can do one simple trick. Uh, we can. actually do this uh, instead of reusing this signal we can actually uh, create a new one and maybe place it somewhere here no fm qam ah oh, crap let's put it here all right so let's name it uh pm mode mode that's going to be 16 bits of standard logic vector <laughs> 
sorry, I'm back. Uh, all right, so that's 16 bits, PM mode. So let's use that signal to uh, connect. Connect the new block with the uh, register 12. The register is already 16 bits, so we don't need uh, vector slicing. And if I save that, no errors. Yoohoo. All right. All right. So we've got the PM mode ready. Now let's do this. Let's copy over this part, entity. I know VHDL is very verbose and requires the user to write a lot of code that is not really needed, but VHDL wants it. So let's give it to <laughs> VHDL. Yeah, let's put it here or after the QAM. Right, so the only change is that we need this. Is that it? Component, yeah. So that's our new component. Saved and no errors. Very good. Now let's do this. So let's copy that part. So we are doing a uh, signal routing right now. So we have created the block that turned out to be very easy because we had the NCO already and we just took the lookup table from the NCO block. And then uh, since the block is ready, we just have to connect it. So uh, I am modulator, SSB, uh, Hilbert, QAM. All right, so let's go here. Let's do this. Uh, PM mode zero is defined as PM modulator, probably. Port map. Uh, 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 uh. Too many tabs. That's not Python. So even if I do this, it's going to work. So don't worry. <laughs> uh, PM modulator. That's the name. Yeah, that's the name of it. Uh, the port map is. As I said, it's very verbose language, so we have to put a lot of stuff to make it do what you want. Uh, all right, so the modulator in is the mm, PM mod. What is the name of the signal? Yeah, PM mod. That's it. Now, the... all right, sorry. Don't have time for that. <laughs> mod, okay, so that's IO and QO. Now the outputs are let's reuse those for the QAM because I don't really need to create another pair of inputs for the multiplexer. So let's just have this IQAM TX, probably Q. QAMTX, yeah. So I'm going to reuse those. All right, saving. Error. Yeah, expected. Uh, syntax error. Mm -hmm. But of course. Yeah, fixed. All right. So let's do this. Let's regenerate the netlist and take a look at the netlist analyzer to see if everything is still connected properly and I didn't anything up. <laughs> it's also a good time to check private messages if there are any.
yeah, it, it takes a minute to synthesize. If it takes too long, then it's a good indicator that something is wrong. I hope this is not the case. So in the meantime, let's take a look at the <laughs> spectrum. Yeah, so we are going to get rid of those spikes later on, but for the proof of concept, we are not going to do anything about it because, uh, hell, it's okay, it doesn't hurt. Okay, the synthesizer is done. Of course, we want to regenerate the netlist. Yeah, let's take a look again. We've got the registers, and then register 12 gets routed to the PM mode, yeah, as expected. Then we've got the I and Q uh, signals going to the, that's input number three uh, of the multiplexer, and then the rest just stays the same. Oh, and by the way, we also have two uh, digital to analog converters just to peek at the I and Q branches in real time. So I've got the scope connected to those DACs, so we can take a look at that later and see the constellation as it exists in the FPGA. So not at the receiver side, but rather at the transmit side. So that's very interesting. That's very good for debugging because uh, you can see what's going on, especially if you are doing things like the Hilbert transformer and you want I and Q branches to be perfectly aligned in phase, because if they are not, you're getting a lot of crap in the spectrum. So we don't want that. Uh, okay. Okay, so that's done. Uh, we've got the PM ready. Now, uh, we should be able to write to that register, number 12, or C in the hexadecimal, and expect the FPGA or the AT86 chip to transmit a valid PM signal. No, uh, let's try and do this. Uh, let's build the rest of the the rest of the code, uh, the rest of the config for the FPGA. So that's going to take probably two minutes. And in the meantime, uh, let's take a look at the code that runs on the STM32. So sorry for using uh, Cube, <laughs> but it's very simple to use. And for the proof of concept, it's actually very, uh, allows for very fast development. So I'm using it. Uh, OK, so this is where we set the modulation type. So right now, it's 0. And if we look at the table here, uh, it's it's here. So we've got zero in the mode, and the mode zero is FM. And we need to set that to three because we are using the multiplexer input number three, counting from zero. Uh, so we need three. We are going to write the register three. Uh, this sets the the sideband, which is not relevant in our case. Am I right? Yeah, of course I am. Okay, uh, so that's it. For register zero. Now we start the timer at 24 kilohertz. We are going to write samples at that rate, a lot of comment. Then, okay, the process is done. We are going to run the program in just a second. But before we do that, uh, we've got the ADC sampling uh, floating input. So that's a source of <laughs> entropy. <laughs> just something random and we are writing to register nine which is not correct we want to write to register c then uh since we are taking the the most significant part of the of the word 
we probably want to do we want that or not because right now uh, the ADC runs in 12 bits mode so we can probably move that four bits left to get uh, to get the right signal but I'm thinking if we actually want to do that. Let's try something else. Yeah, that, that's going to be a cool test. All right, so if the code works and if we set the phase to zero, we should get a continuous wave, probably, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so let's do this. Let's inject the code into the FPGA. And uh, while the programming is ongoing, there is a carrier wave, because the last sample is, is held by the IQ transceiver inside the chip. So there is nothing going on over the DDR LVDS. So the, the sample is being retained, I suppose. Now, the FPGA is programmed. It's reset, and now I should be able to reprogram the STM32 to present the FPGA with just a zero sample. Yeah. OK, so this is as expected, but let's do this. Let's. Uh, change the mode of this uh, instrument to uh, modulation analyzer and of course the attenuation is a little bit no actually uh, trace B amplitude and the ref level yeah much better okay so this is our signal of course it's just continuous wave so nothing fancy going on now let's try and do this uh, normally uh, when you transmit a signal that is uh, PSK you've got n different points in the constellation so uh, let's take a look at the spectrum analyzer again We've got something called uh, modulation analyzer, and right now it's in the PSK mode. So you can check the format. You can set the format for the PSK because PSK is a broad family of modulations. So it's not only PSK, it's BPSK, QPSK, all sorts of differential PSK. So for our uh, in our case, let's try and use the binary PSK. So that's two points. And uh, of course, in our case, the symbol rate is going to be 24 kilohertz. Yeah, let's do this. Uh, let's do this. Uh, right now, we send zero words to the FPGA. So the phase should be zero, and it is. But we can do and actually try sending different samples for different phases. So uh, let's do, let's try hmm, how to do it. The sample rate is 24K, and we want to send a stream of random pseudo random symbols to the FPGA instead of sending just constant zero so maybe do let's do this uh, we can check the value of the uh, from the ADC and if the ADC value and one so that's the least significant bit so that should give us some randomness uh, if it's if it's one then do something else do something else and in our case that's going to be this 
Mm. Ah, perfection. Yeah. Okay, so we pull for the value from the ADC. Uh, this arithmetic is not needed, actually. We just need the row ADC value. So uh, if the least significant bit is set to one, then we are going to set a positive uh, phase value. Let's try this one. This bit is, uh, this byte is the most significant according to this, because we send the first one first. Uh, that's register C, yeah. So we send this part first. So if we set it to 10, we are sure that the value is positive. And else we want it to be negative. So we can probably do something like this. Let's actually calculate the, calculate the uh, correct value. So we want to subtract 10. F6, okay, maybe it's F6. All right, so let's try and do this. Hmm. So this should give us two BPSK uh, symbols, random, pseudo random at least. Uh, the si signal generator is just disabled. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so we are getting something. It's not perfect. Uh, the symbol rate is 24K. Yeah, pretty much it. Uh, let's take a look at... Uh, that's the I and Q that I have mentioned before, mentioned before from the DAX, uh, both channels, X and Y. And that should show us actually two points connected and looks like it works, but the face is askew, and I'm not sure what's causing that. <laughs> okay, the spectrum looks interesting. Let's take a look at the... Maybe let's reset the STM32. Okay, still the same effect. All right, so the modulation in. Oh, no, it's this one. <laughs> of course, it's this one. Uh, register 12. That's C, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, of course it is. Uh, uh -huh. PM mode that goes to input number three. Yeah. Right there. Okay, let's take a look here again. Yeah, so the most significant, 10 most significant bits from the modulation input should go here. And of course, that value of mod i is the value that we set here. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's actually try and uh, take a look at the signals that go to the DAC and check if the sample rate is right. So those are the SPI transactions for the DAX, uh, for just one of them. Uh, no, actually, I lied to you. That's not, that's a transaction to the FPGA from the STM32. So it's 24 kilohertz as expected and transfers are kilohertz as expected and transfers are uh, four bytes, and we write value of 
1,000 in hex, 1,000, 1,000. Doesn't look very good because it should be random, at least pseudo random, and it looks constant to me, just 1,000. Let's try and uh, take a look here. Yeah, sometimes is F600, so sometimes it works. Let me try and... Uh, I have disconnected the signal source, but it didn't help a lot because the constellation looks pretty crap, I would say. Uh, there is a lot of phase distortion. Uh, I don't know what the reason is behind that. Hmm. Let's think. The rate is good. Uh, the signal going over the SPI looks good. So the, the phase ward. So this works. The problem might be here. So we've got the theta input as the 10 most significant bits of the mod i. Let me check again if 15 minus 6 plus 9 uh, plus 1 is actually 10. Yes, it is 10, of course. Mm. The sign output goes to QO and the cosine output goes to IO, which makes perfect sense. Uh, What might be wrong? Let's think. So if the signal was perfect, we should get uh, just two distinctive points for for each uh, for both phases that we set for the signal. Uh, let's check and oh, it doesn't help. BPSK. Hmm. The DC peak is quite strange. Uh, actually, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, it looks pretty much okay because we've got two clouds of, uh, of points at the sides of the circle. But for some reason, uh, there is a strong DC component in the signal and uh, we are not actually getting uh, oh <laughs> that's interesting we don't need retraced calcium filtering <clears throat> yeah so that's <clears throat> that probably helped a little but not by much yeah, we, we need no filtering. We are just using a staircase uh, signal as the modulating signal. So uh, maybe we can actually try and uh, visualize in trace A. Uh, that's the IQ. Let's try with constellation. <coughs> There is some phase distortion going on. Yeah, let's take a look here again. We've got the mod i, which is 10 bits. Yeah. Goes to theta. Yeah, it's not rocket science, it should work.
let's try something else. <clears throat> instead of the uh, instead of uh, BPSK, let's try let's try with something else. Let's try with. Uh, Let's try it with four constellation points. Yeah. So I'm changing the format to uh, pi over four the QPSK, no, OQPSK, no, QPSK. Okay, we can try QPSK. All right, so that should. All right, so another if. And another if, because right now we need four, four possibilities, yeah. Okay, so as long as this stuff works, it's okay. But if something doesn't work, it, it gets stressful. <laughs> yeah. And this is my first stream, so don't, don't be harsh on me. Uh, all right, so we are checking this. We would need uh, four different values. Uh, positive, let's try this. Well, maybe the phase deviation is too big, too large. Let's try that before we break the code. <coughs> Maybe this is too much. Maybe we should try with something smaller like this. And instead of F6, we would do this. Yeah, OK. OK, that's going to compile. And meanwhile, we're going to change this EPSK. OK, so that's the carrier wave. Uh, it's somewhat better. Let's reset the micro. Yeah, so the cloud of points is uh, much smaller. The scatter is it's not that large. But what if we change the symbol rate to 12K? No, the symbol rate is 24K. I'm I'm sure about that. Maybe we can reduce the, the rate a little bit. We can do it in two ways. Uh, we've got a clock that runs at 108 megahertz. And if we want the symbol rate to be 24, 24K, uh, the timer has to be set to uh, four and a half uh, thousand, but Let's get it to, can we try and do this? Yeah, 22,500. So instead of regenerating the code uh, in the cube, we're going to play with the value here. Regenerating the code uh, in the cube, we're going to play with the value here. That's timer number seven, this one. Four, four, nine, nine, and we need two, two, four, nine, nine. All right, so the symbol stream should now come at uh, 4.8 kilohertz. Yeah, let's get back to spectrum analyzer. All right, reset, micro, symbol rate 4.8. This is not how it should look like. <laughs> 
we are getting two points, but that's just a measurement error. So that's not valid. Uh, yeah, it's BPSK 4.8, the filter is off, and we are not getting anything meaningful. Uh, let's take a look at the code once again. Uh, yeah, the value is correct. 4.8. And the code is correct too. All right, so let's try and revert the value. and reprogram the STM32. Now there is no phase detouring. I have removed that because it's only used in the FM. All right, so the, the chip is reprogrammed and reset. Let's reset it again. Okay, so that didn't help. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at the... Oh, that's very bad. <laughs> Let's reset the STM32. Sorry, let's reset the FPGA. Looks like Pong, not like QPSK. <laughs> oh, this is not how it should look like. <laughs> it's actually, it's a joke. <laughs> All right, so what's going on? Actually, I don't want to spend three hours on coding the, the phase modulator part in VHDL. But actually, uh, what we see here is just some crazy shit. <laughs> That's advanced ham radio. Uh, let's try and do this. Uh, so this code should be OK. Uh, we present uh, the modulation input to it, which is 16 bits. And we take just the 10 most significant bits out of it. Then we present that to the Syncos lookup table, and we get two values for the sine and cosine. So this is simple. This should work. But for some reason, it doesn't. Let's try and do this. Let's. Uh, Let's comment out this and this. Mm. Let's remove the if part. Let's set it to some constant value like zero. And let's check if that value is actually being transferred to, uh, to the FPGA. Oh, it's AC coupled, which is not good. <laughs> Let's try this. And the range of the DAC is 3.3 volts. Actually, it's 2.5. Sorry, it's 2.5 because, uh, because it is. <laughs> it's supplied by 3.3, but the output goes swings from 0 to 2.5. So we need some additional range. All right. OK, so that's it. Now, mm, so that's for the value of 0. All right, so for the value of 0, we should get uh, the sign at the minimum. Uh, Actually, not at the minimum value, but rather at zero, and the cosine at one. Uh, let's maybe use uh, 
rulers to check if that's 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 probably yeah that's about half of the output range of the uh, of the deck and here it's about maximum range yeah so that that's probably okay that's pro that's probably fine uh let's try this uh since we are using 10 most significant bits for the phase input let's try and uh set the phase to pi over 2 and to do that we need to do some math all right so uh if the tuning word the fa the phase word is zero you get the angle of zero and if the input word is 10 24 of course just the 10 most sig significant bits uh the angle is also zero because it wraps up it's it, it wraps around the unit circle so for one 23 that's the maximum value that we can get so let's do this uh if we want pi over two that's 90 degrees so that's 1024 divided by four because that's one four am i right probably yeah, let's see. So 226. And if we take 226 and shift it left by 6, is that correct? Uh, by 6 and take the hex. Mm, sounds good. Okay, so in theory, if we did that, we should move that point in the constellation from this place. Uh, where is the origin, you ask? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's probably 125. It's probably here. So the origin is here. We've got a phase of zero, so we are here, and we expect the point to move somewhere here. Yeah, somewhere here, if we set that value to 40 in hex, because it corresponds to the angle of pi over 2. If I did the path right, probably I didn't, but let's, let's try. <laughs> okay, so let's run this code again and take a look at the scope. So we expect the point to pop up here. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so uh, just for your information, that point should remain stationary. It shouldn't move. It shouldn't rotate. It should just stay at one place, don't move. Yeah, so some, something is very wrong here. I have reset the FPGA. Now I'm going to reset the micro again. Okay, let's try something else. Instead of setting the value, uh, let's actually try this. Uh, setting by uh, the STM32. Let's try something else. Let's instead of setting the PM mode value from the register, let's actually uh, give it an explicit value for that. So instead of uh, reading from the register, let's try this. And to do this, we actually have to regenerate the code, which is going to take like three minutes. So go grab a coffee or whatever. And in the meantime, it's probably good idea to read the private messages. <laughs> no, I don't have a cat <laughs> attracted by the mouse pointer. So don't worry. And just before the stream, uh, I have updated my Radiant because obviously there's some update and probably uh, they have fixed the 
uh, the the lookup table for the sine and cosine. Yeah, go grab a coffee because it's going to take like two two more minutes. It already maps the design. Yeah. ETA one minute. <laughs> yeah, we've got a nice carrier wave, continuous wave. But we want PSK, not CW today. Okay, Steve. Enjoy the coffee and enjoy the stream. Okay, so by doing this trick, we should uh, force the lookup table to just spit out one value for each branch. So instead of just reading from the register, uh, it should just... Uh... I think I know what the problem is, but I'm not going to tell you yet. <laughs> okay, uh, so instead of just reading the register, uh, we have got a constant that is fed to the modulation input for the PM mod. So let's try and uh, actually flash. Oh, no. Yeah, th that makes a difference. So when you generate a new binary file for the FPGA, you have to make sure that you click this before flashing it because it makes a big difference. And you can spend two days on debugging what's going on. And that was in December when I started playing with FPGAs and VHDL, and I had no clue what's going on. And I didn't know about that magic button. And it caused me a lot of pain <laughs> and a lot of time wasted. Okay, so the FPGA is now the, the bit stream. Uh, let's reset it. And let's take a look at this. All right, so it it jumps over. And this is not what should happen. Okay, so it looks like the problem is within the FPGA because let, let me try and reset the FPGA again. Uh, okay, so the point jumps over, but uh, I had a similar problem once when uh, the signals from the DAX were not really showing what's going on inside the FPGA. And I have spent a few hours to nail the bug that was not in the FPGA. So let's try and do this. Uh, we can try and uh, take a look at the spectrum, maybe, of the signal. It doesn't look good. So it doesn't look like uh, it's some artifact from the deck. So it actually looks like there is something going on uh, within the FPGA. So the PM mod should output uh, two constants for this phase. And that should be uh, a maximum positive value for I and zero value for Q. Uh, or the other way around, I don't remember. Anyway, those values should be constant. And as we see, 
in the spectrum uh, they are not so there is some something going on something fishy going on uh, so let's try and do this uh, Let's take a look at this code. <sighs> what if we just took the sinkholes block and put it here instead of the PM modulator? Is it going to help? Probably not, because the PM modulator block is already doing that. So it's just the PM, uh, the Syncos block uh, disguised. Okay, so this is the problem. We've got the phase modulator uh, fed with a constant symbol, constant phase word. And for some reason, it outputs um, not constant values. And I don't know what the reason is. Why does that happen? I actually suspected that uh, those values, uh, before we change to uh, a constant value right here, explicit value, I suspected that uh, I and Q branches are not latched at the same time because it happens all the time. I mean, uh, this is not, nothing new. And the problems like this, uh, I had to solve them uh, previously. But in this case, when the phase tuning word is a constant, those values should be constant too. So we can actually try and uh, go one step further and set those values to a constant value. So I and Q. And to do that, we would probably need to find where we use those values. No, not this one. This one. Uh, don't don't worry about this. This is <laughs> it's a feature, not a bug. Uh, I'm pretty sure this one, uh, the modulation selector is constant and it's set to th three. So it's not a problem. Yeah, so that's the only place that writes to it. You can try and do this. Uh, comment out this and instead of uh, letting the PM modulator to write to those signals, we can actually write an explicit value to them by hand. And uh, to do that, we probably need to do uh, this. Now, what values do we need? Let's think. Let's start with the zero angle. So for zero, we have sign value or the in-phase value of uh, of one. That's probably this. And for the Q, we've got zero, which is going to be zero. OK, now if we try this, we should get a nice solid point at the right hand side right here without that crazy stuff that's going on actually uh maybe it's going to happen again oh i've missed it so that figure oh i took a screenshot uh, too slow It actually shows uh, saturation of the deck. No, ah, too slow. <laughs>
Yeah, it probably needs some wiggle. <laughs> Okay, so I'm giving this the last chance. And if I don't fix it in, let's say, 12 minutes, I'm going to stop the stream, go cry, and then try again. <laughs> but alone this time, so you don't have to, to watch all of these abominations. Well, in, in theory, a PSK is very simple to implement because you just take the lookup table table and present it with the uh, feed it with the face word, and that's it. So something that's very simple. It's not so simple in VHDL and FPGAs in general. All right, so the code is in the FPGA. No, uh, it's not yet in the PGA. Let's do this. All right. So we are programming the FPGA. Now I'm going to reset it in just a second. All right, the FPGA is reset. And now, I have noticed that the point has just moved from the origin to here. I'm not sure if that's an artifact. Right, so resetting the STM32 shouldn't do anything. Yeah, I have reset it twice. All right, so it looks like this. Uh, we've got a, a constant set to both I and Q, but for some reason, uh, the constellation, the point on the constellation moves, jumps randomly. So it shouldn't happen. And if we look at the net list, uh, we can see that, uh, where is it? Oh, the netlist looks totally different right now. Uh, this register is free, of course. We are not using it anymore. Uh, now we should have the... Where's the phase modulator block? It should go to... Oh, of course. It's not here because it's not used. Because we've got the zero and zero here. Mm. Oh, that's Q3 and Q4, so it's not a pair. So the Q, the I3 is here and Q3 is here. So we've got almost full set of ones at the in phase and zero at the quadrature inputs. So this looks okay to me. Uh, Yeah, and that's rooted to I and Q. Then we've got the digital predistortion, balancer, and offset. And that goes to DAX. And of course, to the DDR block for transmission. Yeah, something is fishy here, definitely. By looking at the spectrum, we can also tell that uh, there's something going on. I wasn't paying much attention to it, but I think the signal jumped when I wasn't looking directly at it. Well, the signal looks solid. And it should look solid because we are feeding just the constant I and Q. Uh, let's try and set the mode the spectrum analyzer and take a look at maybe um, 
where is it phrase average looks clean to me no bumps okay so uh for now i'm clueless i don't know what's going on uh, but it looks like something is going on within the fpga itself uh we can try and do one more thing uh, before i go crying uh we can try and set this value to something else to check if this point is going to move uh, so let's try and set it to uh, the opposite values so this value would go here so that should make the point rotate uh, along the origin so instead of here it should pop up here okay here because the square uh, the, the grid is not exactly square mm, all right so one last time okay so while this is synthesizing uh, i can tell you this uh, this is the output from the dax so this jumps randomly but for some reason i'm not seeing any bumps here when the jumps occur so that's interesting because that might show uh, that might prove that uh, the problem with jumping uh, of that point is caused by the dax and not the fpga itself because if it was actually caused by the fpga we would see bumps here not at the carrier wave but somewhere uh, at the sides if there was a sudden uh, sudden movement of that point on the constellation yeah, there was a bump here and another so maybe that's not exactly uh only a duck issue okay so when this is finished uh we are going to take a look at the constellation again and see if the point moved up if it moves up then uh of course this needs some more debugging but something as simple as this <laughs> that's ridiculous that it requires a few hours of debugging for the, just looking up a value in the lookup table that should be very simple and straightforward but in bhdl it isn't and in fpga world in general all right almost done Exporting files. Yeah, okay. The size is still the same. Programming. So it should be reversed right now um, here. Yeah, so this is zero now, and it was full of ones, except for the most significant bit. And this is now almost full of ones. So that's good. All right. So that's in the FPGA right now. I'm going to reset it and take a look here. <laughs> no <laughs> stay at the <that> place <laughs> okay so uh this doesn't look good uh first of all it moves and then it rotates rapidly mm. 
yeah so now it's it stays in one place but wrong place i'm resetting the stm32 uh, because it's connected to the fpga and it's able to reset it reset the uh all the internal registers and the pll and, and stuff like that yeah so after resetting the the fpga the point the, the point moves up oh no it didn't yeah, so sometimes it works. So it's some meta stability issue or whatever. Now it's in the right spot. But if I reset it again, it's going to move probably. No, it stays stationary. Let's see if I can move it just by resetting the STM32. Well, now it's stubborn, it doesn't move. Oh, now it moved. Yeah. Okay, let's try one more thing, one last thing, I promise. Uh, let's do this. Let's uh, remove this. Let's uncomment this. Uh, let's set the value to uh, 4,000. So is it really? Is it really positive uh, pi over 2? Hmm. That's a standard logic vector, and 10 most significant bits are passed to the theta, and theta is uh, expected to be a positive integer, or not. Yeah, it is, unsigned of theta. Yeah, so it's from 0 to 10, 23. Yeah, almost sure about that. All right. Uh, so going back here, this is fine. We are not going to touch it. Mm, let's do the maths again. Uh, let's try this. Let's try this. Uh, the left shift is by six bits, if I remember correctly, because we are using 10 most significant bits and the whole tuning word is 16. Yeah, so that's six. Uh, no. Uh, 10, 24 divided by four. That's obvious. Yeah, 4,000 unsigned looks good okay so let's try again but this time uh, we are not using explicit values for i and q but letting the lookup table to look them up for us it should do it <laughs> definitely uh, all right synthesizing so Yeah, so in our case, uh, DPD, the balancer, and the offset doesn't do anything. So the offset just adds zeros. The balancer just multiplies both branches by one. So it doesn't do anything interesting. The DPD just uh, multiplies by one also by unity. So that doesn't change the value of either I or Q. So it's like those three blocks don't exist. So it's like 
the I stream from here it goes here. So it only adds some delay from the flip flops, nothing else. But it's not that critical. It, it shouldn't affect the signal that like that. Yeah, so now we've got a constant fed to the PM block and let's see if that changes changes anything. We also, we already tried that before, but uh, let's try that again and reset the F FPGA a few times in a row to see what what's going on. Nice circle. That shouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, we want to do that. And uh, the PM mod, yeah. So you've got the same value again, and I and Q outputs. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's program the FPGA. And after we are done, we are going to take a look here. All right, this is done. Resetting the FPGA and resetting the STM32. All right, nothing happened. Resetting again. The point was briefly there for a fraction of a second. OK, so after fourth reset, I've managed to put the point where it should be. <laughs> But this is actually not real debugging. It's more like playing with the FPGA. OK, so the, it is possible to move the point where it should be, but it goes back. And it shouldn't. So that's very wrong. OK, so uh, now I'm going to stop the stream, go crying, and see you later, probably maybe tomorrow. And I hope to fix this by, I don't know, by local evening is uh, 3.36 local time, PM. All right, so the summary, uh, the PSK is, of course, doable within OpenHD uh, as an addition to, uh, oh, that's, the, that's a nice DAC saturation. Yeah, so uh, phase modulation is, of course, doable uh, in OpenHD as an addition to other modes like QAM, uh, FM, AM, and other modes that are composite, like APSK. So all of that is doable. It just requires some, a lot of time and a lot of effort, but we are going to deliver that and probably before, uh, I hope to deliver it before uh, Friedrich Hafen Expo in Germany this year in June. And the Expo starts at 25th of June, I believe. I'm not exactly sure, uh, give or take two days. So uh, that's it from Wojciech for today. Uh, see you next time. Stay creative and see you next time, guys.